spin half system in an external magnetic field. Spin half systems are widely used in many applications like EPR spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy or quantum computing. In these cases, a particle with a spin half is placed in a magnetic field and turns into a two-level system. This triggers many mechanisms that affect the behavior of the quantum mechanical system. Some of you may have asked yourselves, where is an electron at a given moment in time? Whether it is in a state with spin up or spin down? In this video, you will find an answer to this question and learn about the full picture of spin dynamics in an external static magnetic field. For all the phenomena described in this video, we will use a two-level system for an abstract permagnetic center with an electron spin half for the illustration. We start with magnetic field coupling. So, how does a spin couple to the magnetic field? If a particle has a spin, it will have an associated magnetic moment. Here g is a g-factor of the particle. G-factor is a dimensionless quantity that characterizes the magnetic moment and angular momentum or spin of an atom, a particle or a nucleus. It's essentially a proportionality constant that relates the different observed magnetic moments mu of a particle to their angular momentum or spin quantum numbers. Since we are considering an electron as an example, g is the electron spin g-factor. Mu is Bohr magneton a physical constant and a natural unit for expressing the magnetic moment of an electron caused by its orbital or spin angular momentum. h-bar is a reduced Planck constant, a fundamental physical constant. And s is the electron spin. The proportionality factor is called the geromagnetic ratio of a particle or system. It is the ratio of its magnetic moment to its angular momentum or spin and it's often denoted by the symbol gamma. The energy of a magnetic moment of a particle in a magnetic field is given by a scalar product of the magnetic moment and the magnetic field it experiences. It is known from the classical electrodynamics. So, if we use the quantum mechanical operator for the magnetic moment of a particle, we get the Hamiltonian describing the interaction of the spin with the magnetic field. This is applicable for any spin, not only for the spin half systems. We should add this product to the total energy of the particle whenever we place it under the magnetic field. For our simple example, this is our total Hamiltonian, and we can substitute the expression for the spin magnetic moment of the electron. That is how the external magnetic field couples to the spin. In the absence of any magnetic field, the magnetic moment associated with the electron spin is randomly oriented and the two energy levels are degenerate. So there is only one energy level that an electron can occupy. If we now apply a uniform external magnetic field, for example along the z-axis, it will result in a splitting of the energy level into two. This phenomenon is called the Zeeman effect. In this video, we consider the simplest case. The splitting of the spectral lines occurs in a weak magnetic field and we neglect the spin-orbit interaction. This simplified picture is still illustrative for many applications. So, we place the electron spin under the uniform magnetic field oriented along the z-axis. Recall the Hamiltonian describing the interaction of the spin half system with the magnetic field. Since the magnetic field is applied along the z-axis, we have also the z-component of the spin, which is 1 second times sigma z, the corresponding Pauli matrix. Sigma z has two eigenstates, which correspond to spin up and spin down states, and two eigenvalues, 1 and minus 1. We denote spin up state as ket0 and spin down state as ket1. Since the Pauli z matrix and our Hamiltonian differ just by a multiplicative constant, they obviously commute. Therefore, its eigenstates 
are also energy eigenstates and we immediately get the corresponding energy eigenvalues. Let's have a look at what happens with these energy levels when we switch on the magnetic field. The energy eigenstate which corresponds to the spin-up state increases linearly with the magnetic field with a positive slope. And energy level which corresponds to the spin-down state also depends linearly on the magnetic field, but with negative slope. The splitting between the two energy states is called electron zeeman interaction and it's proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field. This splitting is also increases linearly when we increase the magnetic field. It is convenient to define omega in such a way that the difference in the two eigenvalues is h bar omega. So, at a fixed magnetic field, there are two energy levels corresponding to two different spin states. And this is also a two-level system which can be used as a qubit for quantum computing, for example. The next question which arises is where is the electron at the moment? Which energy level does it occupy? To answer this question, first consider an ensemble of electrons. Quantum mechanics tells us that a spin-half system in an external magnetic field can be found in two possible energy levels. But this does not mean that a spin must point along the magnetic field in thermal equilibrium. It only means that statistically the spin spans most of the time in either of the two energy states. A thermal equilibrium the population distribution over the energy levels obeys Boltzmann's law. The calculation of the ratio between the numbers of spins at the higher and lower energy levels for the magnetic field 1 Tesla and room temperature shows that it is approximately 1. This ratio differs from 1 only in the 8th decimal place. If you count the number of spins in the state up at any instant moment, it will coincide with the number of spins in the state down, but in reality the picture is not static. The electrons are surrounded by various species like nuclear spins and other permagnetic defects which create fluctuating magnetic fields, the so-called spin noise. If the system is prepared in a certain state, the interaction with the environment induces spurious rotations of the state vector on the block sphere, leading to its destruction. Depending on the initial spin state, one can introduce longitudinal and transverse relaxation times. The spin relaxation times are a critical figure of merit for various emerging quantum-based applications, but this topic is beyond the scope of this video. So, if we look at a single electron in an external magnetic field, we never know which energy level it occupies right now. To know the state exactly, you will have to measure it in a single shot, which is possible only in certain cases. We can only say that statistically in 50% of cases it is in the spin-up state or in other 50% of cases it is in the spin-down state. So, the real picture looks approximately like this. The electron is balancing between the all possible states and does flip-flops. The reason for going from one state to another is the interaction with the environment. An important note. The frequency of flip-flops can be reduced by increasing the magnetic field, in other words, by increasing the energy gap between the spin states. It will suppress this process. Now, let's have a look at the spin dynamics under the action of Hamiltonian caused by the interaction with the external magnetic field. Recalling the results we got earlier in this video, we can rewrite the system Hamiltonian simply as omega multiplied by s, where omega is the separation between the energy levels in units of the angular frequency. All the information about the development is contained in the time evolution operator. We can expand this expression in the following way because Sz is a self-inverse operator. We are interested in how the system will behave under the action of this evolution operator. 
For this purpose, let us define the initial state of the system in the most general form, as cat phi, which is just alpha 0 plus beta 1, where alpha and beta are normalized coefficients. And now apply the time evolution operator to this initial state. First, open the braces, acting by the identity and the Pauli Z operators. Then, group the terms with cat0 and cat1, and then recall the expression for the exponential representation of the complex numbers. Now, let's consider two cases. Case number one. Let us suppose that the initial state is the spin-up state. That is the representation of the spin-up state in terms of energy levels and the block sphere representation. This means that alpha is equal to 1 and beta is equal to 0. Applying the time evolution operator, we find the state of the system at arbitrary moment t. Here I would like to remind you that the time is just a parameter in quantum mechanics, not an operator and not an observable. In this equation, time is present within the dimensionless parameter theta. According to our result, we will always find the system in state zero, because it only acquires a phase factor. In other words, if we prepare the system in state zero, it will remain in this state. Case number two. Now we start from a uniform superposition state, when the Bloch vector is aligned along the x-axis of the Bloch sphere. This state is also referred to as a plus state. We can easily find the state of the system after time t, which we denote as cat psi. And now we are going to calculate the expectation values of all three vectorial components of the spin to reconstruct its behavior in the space. First, we do this for the x component of the spin. Recall the formula for the corresponding Pauli matrix and how this operator acts on states with spin up and spin down. Now let's calculate. We apply the Sx operator to the right bracket. Then we take the h bar constant out of the bracket and open the brackets. Finally, we obtain an expression for the cosine expressed through the sum of two complex exponents. We do the same for the other two spin components. That is the sy operator, the action of Pauli y operators on states 0 and 1. Then we just perform the same calculations and get sinus theta. Then repeat for a z operator. And finally we get 0. So the expectation value of the x component of the spin depends on the time as cosine theta as y component as sine theta, and the z component of the spin is always zero. The video on the screen summarizes this result. You may see the behavior of spin half system under the action of the static magnetic field. It means that even if a spin is initially aligned along the x-axis, the magnetic field along the z direction causes it to rotate Physically, this means that the spin processes in the xy plane. This phenomenon is called Larmor precession. It is conceptually similar to the precession of a tilted classical gyroscope in an external torque exerting gravitational field. The direction of precession is determined by the sine of gamma. The spin precession is clockwise for positive and counterclockwise for negative geomagnetic ratios. The angular frequency of the precession is called the Larmor frequency, which is simply the product of the geomagnetic ratio 
with the magnetic field strength. Interestingly, it's exactly the frequency between two energy levels of the electron. Here you should be cautious with the 2 pi factor when talking about the normal frequency or the angular one. The Larmor frequency is important in NMR spectroscopy. Finally, we can reconstruct a full picture. When there is no magnetic field, there is only one energy level which the electron can occupy. When the magnetic field switches on, the degeneracy is lifted and we get a two-level system. Regardless of whether the spin is pointing up or down, it's processing. And because of the interaction with the environment, if the magnetic field is not so strong, the electron can jump from one energy level and back.